colleagues, uh, good morning and welcome to our training, learning, sharing session this morning. Uh, my name is Arndt Huzar. I'm with the UNDP Global Center for Public Service Excellence and I'll be kicking us off this morning. We have a session for you, a three-hour session for you. We do have a break, so it's not too daunting and we will actually make it very dynamic. So we've split the whole three hours into 20-minute sessions, switching speakers, making it very dynamic. And we do have exercises for us to experience a little bit what we are talking about, which is strategic foresight. So let me start us off with a brief introduction. Uh, we have this event here jointly as five partner organizations. And that is the Center for Public Service Innovation from South Africa. We have uh, the OECD, uh, the School of International Futures, UNDP, and UNESCO. And we are all behind this event because we feel that strategic foresight is crucial to the success of the 2030 agenda. Now, you're all quite familiar, I assume, with the 2030 agenda, but what we want to emphasize here is that the world we want exercise and the coming about of the agenda was really a futures exercise. We were looking at, in 2015, uh, what kind of future we envisaged for the world, and we have agreed on a set of goals and targets uh, that we set for ourselves. But we do realize that in all this, sorry, in all this, we have a vi very dynamic environment and things do change. We're constantly exposed to change and disruption. And therefore, we have to look at the future not as a given, but as something that emerges and that we have to constantly query and realize that things do not exactly happen the way we want them to happen. Brief background about UNDP's Empowered Futures Initiative. We've been publishing for about five years on the topic of strategic foresight, and you can find our knowledge products online. Uh, I think I have brought almost all of them here in copies, so you please pick up one that you are interested in. Um, and we've also been running a series of events called the Foresight Exchange. Uh, you can see the listing of countries and regions where we have been active, and these were usually one or two, uh, no, two or three day uh, workshops uh, with various stakeholders looking at uh, a specific topic and then doing a deep dive into the futures um, that you can envisage around that specific topic. As I said, the agenda is a very complex policy environment. You touch one goal or you touch one target, everything starts moving. We're dealing with a very complex uh, uh, system and obviously the agenda only represents what we could capture as, a, as the member states and the UN in terms of that complex development system. But we did define our goals and we now have to look at, when we look at planning and strategic decision making, we have to look at how we deal with that complex environment. This is a picture of the situation analysis in Afghanistan. Uh, done by the American military quite a while back. The general that was presented with this slide basically said, once we have understood this slide, we would have won the war. In recent years, and really just the very right corner of this uh, chart here, demonstrates the influence of humans on our environment, on our uh, world. And you can see here things like water use or ozone depletion. And you can see that for a long, long time, nothing really happened in terms of change. And then all of a sudden, through human influence, we can see massive change happening. So this era is called the Anthropocene. And we have basically with foresight, uh, a lot of tools at hand to better understand what is happening around us. Technology is one of the key drivers of change. Obviously, there are positives, there are negatives about it, and it's very important, and many countries actually use foresight to explore, um, through technology foresight, the impacts, the effects of um, this change on our life and, and, how, and, and basically the impact it needs to have on our policy making, decision making, spending, infrastructure investment, and so on and so forth. 
then of course there is societal change. This image shows a temple in India. The priests decided that the best way to attract people to their temple was to paint it the way a, a Facebook page looks like. And this kind of societal change creeps up on us. It's not something that's really you know, well described and, and publicized or just debated. It just happens on, in, in the corner, in the niches of our environment. And we have to be very aware of what's going on to be able to make uh, impactful decisions. Then there's the new dimensions of development. Uh, a lot of us here in the room might be active in a UN agency or a development agency. And we have to realize that there are new actors uh, playing this game. Uh, Saudi Arabia announced a $500 billion megacity that is 33 times the size of New York City and which will stretch across borders into Jordan and into Egypt. These are new realities. Uh, powerful decision makers leveraging different sources of funds and we just have to be aware that as development actors we need to work in this new environment. There's of course new agents of change. The gray suited bureaucrat that I am is no longer the one making the decisions. It's the people sitting in a cafe with their laptop or their mobile uh, deciding on the uh, investments that they're making, the new companies that they're starting disrupting uh, the economy and uh, triggering off new developments. So with all this going on, we feel that there are new approaches needed. We need new tools to gather intelligence about the future, identify emerging strategic opportunities, measure cross-sectoral impact of policies, enhance our ability to spot risks and opportunities, and ha uh, increase our ability to anticipate and adapt and engage the unusual suspects, the new change agents. When we do exercises with people on foresight, we often have a few images for them to identify with and to say, what, how do you deal with the future? And we then come to this last slide that shows this surfer. And we emphasize that what, where we would like to get in terms of our capability and capacity, and oftentimes we deal with public service agencies, public sector agencies, we would like the people working in these agencies to be like surfers, to actually navigate the change by riding on top of a wave, not being hit by it, and basically not being blown across the ocean like a sailing boat wherever the wind takes them, but to really navigate this change. A brief uh, definition to differentiate the difference, make, or make clear the difference between forecasting and foresight. Well, forecasting is really a process of making justified statements on possible future events based on qualitative, uh, sorry, quantitative analysis and data modeling. It's based on data, and we all know that public data, data received from governments is usually a year old or maybe even older, and that our data sources really often lack quality. Um, Concurrent data is not very often used so far, so it's quite a tricky business to do forecasts. And often, uh, people forget that this is really basing decisions on yesterday, rather than actually future-oriented decision-making based on insights that we can glean from trends and developments that are taking us into the future. So foresight is a systematic participatory future intelligence gathering that is medium to long-term vision building aimed at enabling present day decisions and mobilizing joint action. Now I realize this is a mouthful, but it's a nice definition we feel um, that came from the European Union project called For Learn. And it describes nicely the various levels that the, the connection between futures thinking and present day decision making. To give you a bit of a picture of why we are calling future, why we're saying futures, plural, and not future. It's because we look at various possible futures, and here you have uh, a cone looking from the present, from the now into the future. The, the narrow cone in the middle, the blue one being the projected future, the one that is basically assuming that things are going to be 
pretty much the same way they've always been and that we can just project into the future. That is often uh, based on, on forecasting. And then we have all these other futures, the plausible futures that are closer to the uh, central cone, the possible futures, and then the preposterous, won't ever happen type futures, you know, aliens landing from Mars and things like that. And then there is a very important cone here, which is the preferred futures, the preferable future. That is the one that we have defined in many ways in 2015 for the 2030 agenda. What do we want to happen? What's the world we want? So when we deal with foresight, we basically have various approaches. I'll come to that, but a basic uh, exercise that people practice is to look at signals out there and to identify the key trends and emerging issues that lie underneath them. And when you drive deeper into your research, you can then find the drivers, the systemic structure underneath that are causing these things to happen. There's a wide range of methods, so foresight isn't one method. It's a collection of various different methodologies and tools, and many of them you recognize here probably on the slide, and you would have never thought that this is foresight, right? Uh, you know, it lists things like literature review or science fiction, but they belong to this family because your evidence gathering mode or your uh, way of interaction either with experts, that would be the left-hand side, or with citizens or um, you know, people, people on the street, um, that defines the other range between you know, the really expert-driven insights and the uh, participatory futures. At the center, we have worked on this now for about five years, as I said, and we have evolved an approach that we feel is something that is lean enough and easy enough, so affordable enough for our context of work, which is developing country contexts and public sector in those contexts. We have many governments practicing foresight, and we'll hear some examples uh, after uh, my introduction, um, but some of them are investing heavily into this and spending a lot of money on research and, and foresight products, and others are you know, using a more agile and more cheap and cheerful approach. So what we felt was that we needed to figure out through testing and working with various partners what would be fit best. And this you can read more about in our foresight manual. I'm just putting it up here so you get an idea that there is something to look at <coughs> if you want to find something fairly simple to dive into. Um, we found that there are four application areas for us, and this is where I again have to emphasize that our center in Singapore is basically one focused on public service and public sector. But I think it's quite useful for other uh, um, application or other sectors as well, let's put it that way. So one is visionary foresight. That is looking at various uh, visions of the future and aligning those. The second one is strategic foresight. This looks more at the management, strategy, development, and anticipatory governance. Then adaptive foresight, where we're looking at planning systems and how we can adjust those planning systems or procedures to get more resilient plans. I'll elaborate briefly on this. Think about any kind of plan we know in the UN or in a government. It's usually five-year plans, but as soon as the reality hits the plan, we realize it's no longer valid, it has its problems, the, re the context has changed, environment has moved on. So we actually pretend with a lot of our planning practices that the future is a given, which it, which it is not. So how do we get to a more resilient planning process? That's the question we ask there. And finally, creative foresight, which involves uh, practices from the design space um, or even theater, uh, where you can immerse people into a different future. So various creative practices that help us better design for future uses. You could say, for example, uh, let's think of a public transport system of 2030. How would that look like? And what decisions do we have to make today to be able to have that transport system in place by 2030? Because things take time, right? 
buying new buses or even designing new buses, evolving a new system, new lines, where do our seniors actually live, how do we service them, and so on and so forth. I'll hand over now to my colleague Riel from OECD to take us to the next section. And we will have a bit of Q&A after the introductory talks, which will be after Pierre, I think. Good morning. Thank you very much. It's really a, a pleasure to be here. Um, being in this room, though, makes me feel kind of like we're, we're slightly obsolete. Uh, I first ran around in this part of the play, in this, in this actual location, not with these desks. Uh, in uh, 1960. So it's been a long time for me to cruise around the UN system. I think it's for me one of the critical aspects of this whole presentation and the issue of thinking about the future is that there's a fundamental change taking place. Uh, and it has to do with agency and it has to do with the way in which change takes occurs. The changes that, that are in some senses symbolized and institutionalized by this building and by the idea of nations. Um, I think in many ways is, is very clearly inadequate to our times. It was a brilliant and amazing achievement, but it's kind of running out of road. And I was in Kigali in Rwanda not long ago uh, just about three, four weeks ago, and we, we did a session on the future. Oh, I'll get feedback there. On the future of uh, of Rwanda, and obviously Wakanda. I don't know how many people are familiar with Wakanda. It's the Black Panther Marvel uh, franchise expressing their idea of a future, and it's a very uh, confident future. It's a very persuasive future because it masters technology. And it depicts humans essentially as gods. It's a very common theme these days with the superhero movies and all that kind of thing, is that you know, we're gonna get back in control. We're gonna run things. We're gonna be able to determine the future. I mean, in, in, in simple terms, that, that, that to me sounds not only delusional in some sort of pathological way, but it's, it's fundamentally, from a scientific perspective, uh, just wrong. I mean, one of the big things that came out of the 20th century is the notion that we live in a complex emergent universe, right? So this is a scientific consensus. But to what extent has our social science, has our governance policy caught up with the understanding that we have that we live in this novel, creative universe. I think it hasn't caught up very much. And it's particularly difficult for administrative systems, be they private sector or public sector, to actually be compatible, I said compatible, with what we understand scientifically. Because administrative systems are fundamentally command and control systems. And I think everybody in this room knows that if they make a mistake, if something they do fails, they will not be rewarded for it. In administrative systems, we're meant to be prescient. We're meant to understand what's going to happen and then to implement policies and do things that actually colonize the future. We impose our will upon the future. Now, We've already talked about how the SDGs and the future we want uh, allowed the coalescence of very powerful coalition around a set of objectives. And I think that that's a tribute to the power of the future. The future is certainly very powerful. But it's powerful at a very deep level because the future informs our own personal idea of hope, our own fears, and those of our community, and those of our organizations. So we all use the future, and we use it very uh, basically. A child, a, a baby, before they can talk or walk, uses the future to cry for food, to follow a ball. We're very anticipatory in a fundamental way. But 
we've actually, in some senses, not thought about it very much. And we've, in, in some ways, been unable to incorporate anticipation into our thinking. We're what I call futures illiterate. So for me, there's a kind of transition taking place. It's called futures literacy. Uh, and at UNESCO, we've been working for the last five years on, gain, on, on gathering evidence. And I'm talking through laboratories and through scientific process and through research uh, in UNESCO's role as a global laboratory of ideas. Uh, and let me just read it off here. The future does not exist in the present, but anticipation does. The form the future takes in the present is anticipation. And it's, you know, in some ways it seems like self-evident. You say to yourself, right, yeah. Anybody here visited the future? No. Anybody here have data, evidence from the future? No. So how does the future exist? Well, in the conscious human thinking, it exists as imagination. The future is only a fiction. And we can develop that fiction for different reasons and with different methods and different tools. Uh, and one of the things is how to become better at understanding the way we use our imagination. So anticipatory assumptions are the frames, narratives, and variables that shape what we imagine. If I ask you to imagine something that's not here, you need to have a framework. You need to have a set of assumptions. If you're thinking about the future of the economy, you're going to think about jobs or enterprises or firms, but you're making that up. <laughs> you're assuming that there will be jobs and firms and enterprises and all that will exist. And you're using those assumptions to describe what you're imagining. This is a very powerful thing about the future. And I think it's really one of the central reasons why we're here and, and why this session's taking place, is because the future has this very powerful catalytic invitation to be more explicit about what you're thinking about, to be more explicit about how you're constructing your imagination, and crucially, how to understand your fears and hopes. So I put this microscope here and the cyclotron atomic accelerators here, because one of the things that we're doing now is beginning to expose, conduct research in to the anticipatory assumptions underlying how people imagine the future. And all of the various methods that we're going to discuss today are revealing in one way or another the anticipatory assumptions that people use in order to imagine the future. How they construct their own hope. Why they're frightened. Why am I afraid for my children? Because I don't know what jobs they're going to have. What are we going to do about pensions? What are we going to do about climate change? All those things are things that we project using anticipatory assumptions. So it turns out that when you want to run a laboratory or do conduct a process or get people to think about the future, and Arndt's already talked about forecasting, which is one way of imagining the future, or strategic foresight, which is another way of imagining the future, all these different ways of imagining the future can be designed. And one of the key aspects when we use a tool is why are we using a particular tool? Why am I using a hammer and not a screwdriver? Why am I putting together the shelves with glue or with nails or with screws? What are my design choices and why am I making them? Is it just because I happen to have that? Is it just because I have some nails on the table and a hammer and so I'm going to use a hammer and nail for everything? So the work that we've been doing here has to do with how to design the way people use the future. Now given that people use the future all the time and that the future is central to the way we think, what we see, what we pay attention to, there's an exit sign over there, right? It's to get our attention because it's preparatory. We're preparing for a catastrophe and it's meant to take our attention in the moment when there's a crisis. We do this all the time and we're actually quite good at it. But understanding the tools that we use in order to construct the future actually can improve our ability to understand the world around us. So just again to go back to complexity, let me talk about, this is the epistemological side. There's the ontological side and the epistemological side. But on the epistemological side, one of the things that's, that's quite striking about the, the integration of complexity into our thinking is that our complex universe consists not just of generalizable things. What's the average height of all the people in this room? But I could, we could figure it out. We could measure everybody and get the average height. And what would it tell us? 
about the people in this room? Very, very, very little. But it would be a nice statistic, right? And we could say, what's the average of everybody in this building? What's the average of everybody in New York? What's the... We have lots of statistics. And the industrial era, the administrative era, the government standards era, the national language, national standards era, which we're sitting on top of after a couple of hundred years, has been very good at generalization, but very weak at the specificity of time and place meaning. But your life is not an average. Your life is not a statistic. Your life is here and now at this moment. What you learn, what you feel, what you see, how you see it, the fact that we're in a room with no windows, that changes the world around us. And specificity is something that we have actually been really weak at taking into account. And strangely enough, if you're weak at taking into account specificity, you're actually weak at taking into account meaning. Because meaning emerges from our direct experience and the specificity, time, place, difference. Not some general average. Oh, thank you, I'm an average. That doesn't compute as well. So I just put this up very briefly. The book that it's based on uh, is called Transforming the Future. It's just come out about uh, in April. We had the book launch at UNESCO uh, in Paris, uh, what, last week, uh, with the president of the General Conference introducing it. This is a, a photo I took of the, <laughs> because I don't have the actual uh, digital version, but we've run futures literacy laboratories all around the world on all sorts of different subjects with the aim of revealing and exposing people's anticipatory assumptions. Now, it turns out that you have to design processes that allow people to be genuine, authentic to their anticipatory assumptions. So very often, if we come in as uh, colonialists or imperialists or even imperial thinkers, um, we don't get the anticipatory assumptions that actually shape somebody in Nigeria or in Sierra Leone when they think about the future. They think about the future, and they have models and methods. They have anticipatory systems. But they come back, and they give us the Western consensus when we have that discussion. So there's a very important design issue about escaping from the colonization of people's thinking about the future and in a colonialist's approach to the future. They're both very powerful. So all of this is about changing the conditions of change and fundamentally changing the relationship to human agency, which is a bit why I said, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit, a bit pushy and perhaps unfair to say this place is obsolete, although <laughs> it's, it's a debatable issue, I suppose. But fundamentally, if we're going to turn into, towards different models of development, the source of that model of development I don't think can be the same. It cannot be the ideologies of the 19th century, which still fundamentally inform, you know, uh, Industry 4.0 or Wakanda as an image of the future. The source of hope and fear, the reconciliation of human agency with complexity, which means welcoming uncertainty, not treating uncertainty as an enemy, because uncertainty upsets planning, upsets command and control. Reconciling human agency with that will require a significant transformation in the way we conceive of our role in history, I think to much more modest position, but also it involves a change in the way in which we think about spontaneity, inspiration, and the whole. Means as ends, values now as legacy. These are not entirely new concepts. There are many civilizations and cultures that have valued these approaches that could be argued as being wisdom as the foundation for social functioning, social operation. But one of the ways to come at this is to think about how we use the future. Uh, and that's what futures literacy is all about. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Pierre Schoenrath, and I'm from the Center for Public Service Innovation in South Africa. You'll see we are moving very quickly through these slides, um, and we basically just give you a little bit of each 
aspect um, to, to make you a little bit more nosy and inquisitive about um, the future, but the subject of the future as well. Um, I'm an African. I may be the paler version of an Africa, but I'm an African nonetheless. And we have seen over the years so many fads and so many things brought in by development partners and by the UN system and by all the various uh, multinationals. Um, so the question is, is foresight yet another one? Um, and what on earth are we going to do with it? So what I want to do in the next 20 minutes is just bring it down to the reality of developing countries. Obviously, I'm speaking from a Southern African perspective, um, but we have seen with the UNDP a number of experiences, and I'll just um, want to touch um, on a few of these issues. I think the one of the assumptions that we have seen uh, lately is that people are wondering whether foresight is actually um, necessary for Africa when we have so many, and other developing countries, if we have so many development challenges already to deal with, shouldn't we focus our energy on that? And I think then we underestimate the ability of developing countries to do foresight. Um, just to use a few uh, examples, you'll see the, the diagram on the left-hand side is also on page 39 of the, the manual. Um, that's a scenario that was developed about 30 years ago, um, just after um, the negotiated settlement in South Africa. Some of us would not know, but 10 years before that, there was a high low road scenario that asked the question, what are we going to do in South Africa? And we chose the high road, um, and it brought us to that scenario. Um, just to give you a little bit of an indication of the power of scenarios, the Icarus on the top right-hand side was where we actually found ourselves, or almost found ourselves, just a couple of months ago. Um, so it was a very powerful projection into the future. Subsequently, um, and as recent as one month ago, um, there's the latest um, scenario, uh, the Indlula Miti, a scenario which means giraffe looking over the trees and looking into the future. So Africa has the ability to develop their own scenarios, their own foresighting. But um, we have also uh, the challenge of not following through. Um, let's also not underestimate the potential positive impact of this for Africa. Um, some of the things that we've seen in scenario uh, planning and specifically in foresighting um, are on the negative side what the former governor of the Central Bank of Kenya said is then when we are faced with external shocks our typical reaction is of policymakers is to reduce the long-term development budget in favor for um, a recur recurrent expenditure. And I think that's what we want to move away for. So long-term planning is slowly gaining traction. We can see that the SDGs has already provided the opportunity to fast-track these long-term planning, but the need for innovation has been strongly expressed um, parallel to doing foresight. Um, one of the concerns that is mostly driven, driven by those in this room um, and in this building and in the partner organizations um, and that we need to flag uh, because it's not always driven by the decision makers, by the communities from the grassroots up. Um, and what we've also seen is that there is work to be done to create that mind shift from a reactive governance approach to an um, anticipatory governance approach. And then the curse of the log frame, sorry, that's maybe putting it too strongly, um, but over the years we have embedded certain processes and in every exercise I've been, everyone wants to start asking, what's the process? What's the next step? To have this typical linear approach to, approach to foresighting as well. Instead of starting conversations, starting narratives, which is the developing country's strength is the narrative, instead of starting that. We do require strong leadership uh, moving forward. Just to again to focus on a few examples of what has happened in countries is it always starts and mostly starts with a question about the impact of development planning. 
which we can see is not rendering the necessary result. But then we default to the standard approach because what's the alternative? What we've seen is that that then created a discussion on the future, a national narrative, the SDGs, Agenda 63 in the case of Africa, and opportunities that are identified to innovate. But the question then remains, is there an enabling environment and enabled people to drive this? And can we embed that then into the national development planning? Um, and then finally, to replace M&E uh, as we know it, can we monitor the future? Uh, very quickly, a few examples. Rwanda used foresight to look at beyond Kigali. There's one major city, what about additional cities? What is about additional hubs um, to create inclusive, safe, uh, safe and resilient um, environments um, to go forward? Mauritius did the same. What about Mauritius as a smart island? Creating smart cities, creating an innovative public service, creating a regional transport hub um, because Southern Africa is basically served by Johannesburg. I personally don't like the last one um, because it will take some uh, business away from South Africa, um, but that's very subjective. Um, bringing it down to a very specific development challenge that Lesotho looked at, what about rural healthcare in the mountainous areas of Lesotho? Can we use tourism, which is one of the SDGs, um, and tourism for good, um, and can we use technology to bring healthcare to remote communities? So they have a um, very good tourism attraction of pony tracking up in the mountains. Um, why can't those ponies take medicine uh, and valuable supplies up as well? I won't talk too much about water, but that is one of the other issues. How do you use water to develop and not just export to South Africa. Um, one of the other things we did was to look at the sub-national um, application of foresight. And one of the local governments and provinces, the Eastern Cape for those that uh, know South Africa, looked at this and they said, we are not achieving our targets. We are not achieving developmental impact. What can we do? Um, we also seen that the national discourse is not necessarily the provincial or the regional discourse. Um, and everything is M&E driven for compliance sake. Our targets may be smart, but they are not ambitious, they are not synergic, they are not innovative, they are not catalytic, they are not even opportunistic when we see something come up. So um, you'll see that very complicated um, uh, a graph on the right hand or, or depiction on the right hand side. In essence, what they want to do is to move from a projected future into an inspirational future using innovation and inspiration and leveraging the youth um, because you have to change the development trajectory. The second challenge that they have um, been faced with is that the if targets are met, they the impact is still low. So you have a department or you have an institution that achieves a 100% score in terms of their targets, but you don't see the development impact. You then see that translates in high cost of employment in the public sector, which is a typical developing country problem, and you see an over-reliance on the political economy that then opens up the opportunity for fraud and corruption, and you see an over-reliance on development. So what can you do? And Foresight then provided the province with the opportunity to transcend the current state um, and to jointly innovate towards this future. Um, and um, lastly, um, one of the things that we've also experienced is that development partners are very keen in bringing in Foresight but their own staff are not exposed to foresight. Their own staff are not doing foresight, uh, which is a huge challenge. So what we did there was to start with the UN country team, a process that then dovetails into the country and the subnational process so that we have these sector-specific conversations that would then eventually lead to empowered futures. Um, so foresight, in essence, is creating your future legacy. Um, and I think there's no better words to use this um, 
is the is the words of Nelson Mandela that said that the world is in our hands. The future is in our hands. And next week, as we celebrate um, that, we can start not just looking at the here and now, but also in um, terms of the aspirational future. Um, and I think one of the beautiful things, if you go back to the scenarios, if it wasn't for the inspiration of this group of leaders, um, then in South Africa and in Africa, we would not have achieved the future that we wanted. And I think that is just a, a depiction of how powerful um, a future scenario can be. Thanks, Arons. Back to you. Colleagues, we have gone through the first three presentations very quickly. Uh, so what we tried to do here was to give you a quick introduction, then a bit of a zooming out into the thinking behind foresight, and now some examples. We'll open the floor for some questions or comments, and then after about 12 minutes, go into the first exercise. Does anybody have a question for any of the speakers or any comments? Please. Um, and thank you for very interesting presentations. Uh, my name is Ernesto Soria. I work for the OECD uh, on, on policy coherence for sustainable development. And uh, I was wondering, this is just a very basic question because um, when we look at policy coherence, we see that one of the big barriers to achieve policy coherence in policy making and planning is the different perceptions of the decision makers. So I was wondering if there is a forum or a platform where the different national visions, because I, I assume that this, the, these tools are, are, are used from a national perspective, but we are dealing with a universal agenda. And, and we know that the decisions taken in one country in, in, in this in really interconnected world are going to have implications elsewhere, but also implications later in the future. So I was wondering if there is a platform where countries that have developed national visions towards 2030 or 2030 or, or 2050, um, they discuss their assumptions and, 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 and link this to the global agenda. Thank you. I'm looking to my fellow speakers, if anybody knows of a platform. I'm not sure it exists, so you might have just invented it. Um, but in terms of uh, the tool being useful for bringing decision makers together, there are various people in this field that are doing this. I know about the EU, uh, where of course you have representatives from different member states with very different perspectives on what is happening in the world. And they use a tool to basically look at big trends, mega trends, and try to work together to come to an agreed understanding of what these mega trends mean for the future. That's just one example. I think this tool is, has been publicized. It's available online, if I'm not mistaken. Duncan, do you know more about it? No, and I, I hi Ernesto. Um, I could just answer from the um, OECD perspective also. In strategic foresight, we, as you know, um, do convene a, um, a global community of foresight practitioners from every government where exactly these kind of discussions do take place, but not specifically around the SDGs, around many of the topics that will affect the SDGs. But I think it, it uh, might very well be um, a good, I'm not aware of, and it might be a very good initiative to actually um, convene a discussion specifically around SDGs using strategic foresight and and explicitly asking those questions, what are the potential disruptions, what are the, are the alternative scenarios out there, that, and how could they impact um, some of our assumptions that are embedded in our, all of our plans for, for going forward and on the SDGs. That's something we're trying to work with individually with countries, and uh, I think um, a global forum on that could be very interesting. Hello, Ernesto. Um, my understanding is that CEPAL, um, as a regional body, um, has been very advanced in bringing together all the countries of Latin and Central America to have conversations around this. So the work that they've done, I would really like 
like to highlight, especially it's ILPES within CEPAL that has been convening that. So I know of that on a regional level, but there is a real need for this at a global level as well. Um, okay, from my side as well, I think what we've done with the Global Centres uh, Assistance is since 2015 started a conversation among Southern African countries, the SADC Forum, um, on uh, foresight, because you're quite right. Um, the issues are transversal. Um, if you take, for example, the Southern African Customs Unit, a union, um, a, a union um, impacts on the salaries of public servants, specifically in Namibia and uh, Swaziland and Lesotho, and you can't do foresight without looking at the regional dynamics. So we made sure that there are more than one SADC representative um, being part of the regional foresight workshops that we did there. Um, just a brief thing. Uh, the, the last uh, three years, UNESCO has now established eight chairs in Future Studies, Futures Literacy. And essentially what's happening is a global network is building up at the university level, but also at the policy making level, where both the theory and practice of using the future in its diversity is coming to the forefront. Uh, and so there's a sharing of, of the how-tos, how do you run a national foresight process, but also the question of how does the future get integrated into the way people think uh, and how can people be trained in order to use the future more explicitly uh, and with more awareness of the design principles underlying the use of the future. So I think we're moving into a phase, this might be cyclical, but I think we're moving into a phase where there are many different organizations, different uh, professional groups that are beginning to try and think more systematically, consistently, and let's say sustainably about the future. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, globally, knowledge is available, sir. But what is happening is knowledge is getting what you call it's duplicated. That knowledge is not reaching the right people. The only answer to this is uh, creating a knowledge excellency, is what you can call it as uh, the skill development centers on various uh, self development goals. It makes the reality. I'm thinking this if we have the what you call it as um, the global knowledge networks where we can link the from the village level to the top level and it really makes the grassroots. One, one, one thing I can tell you, globally everybody is talking about the smart, smart cities and all. That if you look at the global four billion people, most of them are uh, middle class, low class people, poor people, it's in villages. If you empower the villages as grassroots level, entire knowledge system can reach into the common platform. That we can, we, we all work together on a global knowledge platforms and uh, center of excellencies in each uh, state level and country level and share the knowledge as open knowledge we can really make the things. Because the duplication is happening. For the last 20 years, we have seen that one. Uh, trillions of data is moving on the internet. If you look at the 80% of the data, what is moving on the internet is the one way is junk data. Really, the data is nearly not making the people to what you call sustainable live this thing. If we work on that model, I'm thinking we can we reach our goals in sooner than us. Uh, based upon 17 SDGs, we started on what you call Smart Villages Project in Andhra Pradesh in state of India. And then after seeing the grassroots level villages and all, then we made it, it came out with a new model called uh, self-development goals on seven SDGs. Make, linking, making all the groups more, more not complicated, linking the groups, uh, groups into common requirements. And if we work on the similar models, we can reach um, our goals. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. A real call for connecting and for bringing knowledge together. I think this links up very nicely with what Real has presented on the uh, futures literacy effort around universities. Any other comment or question? Yes, please. But in the Development Cooperation Directorate, we're working on thinking about how to bring the development agencies together to think about this practice more effectively. So we have a new unit working on futures, outreach, um, foresight issues. So this is a good moment, I think, to take some of the advice that you had given, you know, just as I was coming in about the fact that the development partners need to get with the program in terms of their foresight units as well. So we can put you in touch with the individuals putting that together. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Any other questions or comments? 
All right, well, it's good. We start a bit earlier with our exercise. It gives us a bit more time. I'll hand over to Duncan. Thank you. All right, good, whoops, there we go. Good morning, everybody. Um, so just to recap a little bit, we had uh, a sort of overall overview from Arndt first about sort of what is strategic foresight and why it's important in general to policymaking and then particularly with the SDGs. Uh, then we had Viel who gave us more of a, a theoretical understanding of that, including the importance of building futures literacy globally. And then from Pierre, we had a case study of how this can, can and has been, uh, needs to be actually done within national governments, um, particularly around SDGs. And now I'm going to give you a bit of a sense uh, about the uh, a case study about building it in, using it at uh, an international organization level, the organization I'm with, the OECD. And uh, for those of you who uh, don't know, the, the OECD is, uh, 30, has 36 member countries, but it also works with a very large number of countries around the world, has partnerships with them uh, across a range of policy issues, and is really uh, devoted to being a sort of center of excellence and a global policy forum on, on a whole range of um, critical issues. So obviously strategic foresight is very important to doing that. The, the OECD's slogan is uh, better policies for better lives and my slogan that I'm trying to push across the OECD is that uh, is better foresight for better policies or really that in the world that we are in today, it's actually a re responsible policy making requires preparing for and anticipating the future. So um, within the OECD, our um, our mandate is to really help strengthen the capacity to do this, to, to actually conduct foresight and bring it to bear on policy making. And we do that by working across the organization with the different directorates, uh, including uh, our colleagues in, in BCD, as just mentioned, but also around all of the, the various policy issues from, from labor to taxation to trade and so forth. And uh, that's a big chunk of our work so that those, so that this thinking is building its way into all of the advice that's being delivered to governments across all of those areas. We also work with governments around the world, uh, as I just mentioned, partly through this government foresight community. And I'll put out the advertisement now that if any of you are, are either working in foresight yourselves within your governments or know of colleagues who are, that is an open global forum. We invite them to Paris twice a year to really um, convene among foresight experts working in government and to share best practices as well as ideas on, on emerging trends. And then uh, we also work directly with governments. Um, we had a recent, recent projects with both Slovenia and then Slovakia, taking, uh, bringing strategic foresight into their SDG planning um, process to make sure that their, their, their plans for 2030 are actually, don't look like a strategy for 2018, but that are actually taking into account the range of possible futures that we could see by them. And then we also uh, try to bring strategic foresight practice and insights into high level policy dialogue uh, when that is being convened around the OECD or also around the G7 and G20. So, um, but before I, well, so what I'm gonna do today is I'm to work backwards, I will tell you a little bit more about our um, did a particular initiative that we run over the last year within the OECD, which is looking at the impact of digital transformation and particular range of scenarios that we've developed to help uh, use those to test and future-proof policy making. But before I do that, I'm going to move us into the participatory uh, part of our morning here and get you all to take part in a brief exercise. Now I should point out that this is uh, meant to be a learning session, so not only do we hope you, to learn, hope you will learn from the exercise itself, but also this is a very simple exercise that you could take back and use with your teams tomorrow. As you'll see, it's very simple, it's very quick, but it, it can spur the thinking right away uh, among your colleagues and get them into space to be thinking more creatively about the future. So very simple, what we're going to ask you to do is I'm gonna ask you to turn to your neighbor. So we're gonna do this in pairs and you can be in groups of three of you if you get into an odd number. Um, and I want to ask you to think and just discuss with each other what you see as an emerging trend or potential disruption 
that could impact cities and communities in the coming 10 to 15 years. Now, those of you who know about foresight might know we also have a, we have a term for this we often call a, a weak signal of change. And that's where you know, we're all familiar with some of the big mega trends already, right? You know, climate change and, uh, and population aging. But sometimes uh, it's the, to, to actually find emerging trends that we've not yet factored into our thinking. You look for a sign of a change that's happening now, that's present in reality, but that if it were to grow, could have a significant impact. So we can point back to Uber in, in 2009. If you found a little article about a ride-sharing service you know, in, the, in the Bay Area, and you could have said, now what would happen if that really grew, um, expanded to the whole planet? What could that mean for the future of mobility, for the future of uh, vehicle ownership, for, um, and so forth? That would be an example of a, a weak signal of change. So you can, that, that's a guide if you want to. You can be thinking about something that surprised you, something you've noticed, and think, well, what would happen if that grew? Um, but, uh, but really, any, uh, it's brought it out to any, anything you see as an either emerging trend or potential disruption. And because this session is around um, SDG 11, we're going to get you to focus on particularly its impact on cities and communities. So we're going to have five minutes for you to discuss, and then we will hear back at least from some of you to the group. Any questions? Great. Please turn to your neighbor and see what you can come up with.
All right. All right, everybody. I always hate to stop a good conversation. This looks fascinating, but I want to be able to share some of your insights with everyone else. So um, we're going to do a rapid fire gathering up of some of the ideas. So I'll, I'll ask some of you to volunteer, but to keep your, um, your points to under under a minute uh, at least, and just to describe us what was the uh, what was the change or the disruption that you saw and what you think some of the, the impacts could be. So who would like to go first? I'm gonna come to, I'm gonna start pointing if nobody volunteers, so please, yes, in the back. Oops, and sorry everyone, if I just ask you to be quiet, and those people, if you wouldn't mind just getting near to a microphone uh, for the, um, just the closest mic there, maybe to the desk, would that work? Thank you. As one of the main potential uh, disruptions, sort of all over the world, it was in it was a spectrum of bad, as opposed to a spectrum of good. It had different levels of threat, and then we also put cybersecurity as a threat, particularly within cities, because <coughs> if you close down, say, the internet, then that would close down banking. So, all sorts of things with that. Okay. Border security and also cybersecurity. Okay, fascinating, super. Thank you. Okay, who's next? You guys are talking. Why don't you go? Yep. Oh, you, that's you. You, the talking ones. Hello. You, you, you. Yep. Yep. You. Okay. Which one? Go. Uh, we are we are three people. Uh, both of them living here in New York, and uh, I'm from India. So we discussed about uh, uh, the problems of the developing countries, and also how we could. Uh, gain from the technological advances which have been made in the developed countries. Now, uh, my f uh, fear was uh, how would we feed the growing population? Now, India already houses one-sixth of the population of the world and growing by the minute. So where is the food going to come from? Because development, development, it's eating into agriculture land. And today, agriculture has become a very uh, non-remunerative profession, so people are giving up their land and coming to cities. There's a lot of migration happening. So where are we going to feed the, the growing population? That's one, could be a major disruptive factor. And second is the, the pressure on the cities is increasing so much. Already there is no drinking water. There's a lot of flooding during the, uh, India is a, a monsoon-based economy. A lot of flooding that happens and the disasters that take place in cities. So uh, it's very scary to think of what will happen in the next 10 to 15 years. But then there's a ray of hope also in getting technology from uh, which has been already developed in other countries. For example, uh, we discussed about the uh, telephone penetration in, in India. 20 years back, very few people even had a, a phone at home, a landline. But today, for a 1.3 billion population, we have more than 2 billion mobile phones. Literally every Indian has more than one mobile phone and with Wi-Fi connectivity with pretty good speeds and at very low cost. So technology has definitely played a major role in improving the communication in the uh, country. And the third point was with so many people migrating to cities and so many people migrating out of the country, the, the, the so-called smart ones who might go abroad to study and, and settle down there and work there, what will be the uh, mental state? She's a psychiatrist and we discussed about what could be the uh, mental state of the people living in the slums and looking at the huge disparities. So this can be a major factor. Depression is going to be a, a major health issue in the developing economies and we have to see how we are going to tackle uh, this also. So in the five minutes, I think this is what we that could uh, Excellent. discuss. Excellent, thank you. And we talked about uh, uh, electric uh, cars coming in as, as a major new technology which could prevent, uh, which would reduce a lot of noise and pollution and, and all okay, that. I'm so stop you or there won't be anything that's left the, for anyone yeah. else. But this, is, this is great, sorry, did, did that capture your points? Okay, excellent, who's next? Over here. Uh, okay, um, my my feeling is uh, uh, of the, the next 15 years, the, what you call it as um, the cities um, themselves will ecologically will affect. They won't they won't sustain on themselves. Okay, the basic problem with cities is in all over the all over the world. The cities are corrupted with um, massive population from various levels of the people. There is no equilibrium between the all the societies living in the in the cities. Uh, the only way to talk about is um, uh, uh, let us not talk about the smart cities and all this. Okay, so what do you call? We should talk about the smart societies, smart uh, what you call villages, and a smart ecosystem where the ecosystem can be sustainable. That is my view, actually. Okay. 
smart ecosystem movement. I guess the smart ecosystem. Yeah. The basically, the, the ecosystem should be sustainable itself. The ecosystem, if ecosystem is sustainable, the human and humanity also sustains itself. Today, the human greediness is making the ecosystem to get affected. And if humans are cheats the ecosystem, ecosystem cheats the human system. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. bit about um, this kind of soft signal, or maybe it's not that soft actually, of inequality. Um, but particularly, we were talking about how there's a lot of um, really educated, talented people in kind of the 25, even to 40, that are, I think, less and less secure in positions in their kind of living situation. We were talking about yesterday on the subway, I heard someone say, I don't know if I'll ever get an apartment because you have to provide like an 80 times guarantee the rent. Um, these types of things where it's the systems that are in place seem to really favor those with a lot of income. And so we were talking about that. And do you want to yeah. add anything, Francois? So we were talking about how that seems like it could be a pretty major disruption because the systems are not matching what people's realities are. Yeah, a big critical uncertainty about uh, the direction of inequality um, globally. Yeah. Okay. Yes, please. Um, we we um, couldn't quite decide if we're going to have an um, optimistic or a pessimistic scenario. <laughs> Um, we had both a little bit. Um, both, we were thinking about that smart cities will be a concept that will, um, will increase um, over time and in, in intensity and in, a way in sophistication. But we also thought about that the circular economy um, might be something more on the positive spectrum of scenarios, um, could be something that maybe could in general be strengthened or there might be an opportunity for that in the future. Um, at the same time, more on, this, on the social side, the social dynamics, you were maybe a little bit more pessimistic in terms of that we saw that in a way the current trend to more fragmentation in smaller and smaller groupings and identities um, will, also co will also continue. And, and you had something as well. Good. Well, maybe just to add the um, automatization of labor and what it does yeah. to society and you know, that's another one. Great. Okay, I'm going to do one or two more. Do another back row over there. Yeah, I'm I'm volunteering now. Step out of the room began with the question of what to do about youth unemployment in cities and rising youth unemployment in these contexts, and then we talked about the rising population in general um, in the youth area and how are we going to actually begin to manage the the distance? You know, what are we going to do to? to support those individuals. And we ended the conversation in an interesting place. You can make some comments on artificial intelligence as well, but we ended the conversation where we felt like we needed to get the foresight capacity into rural areas, and that it could be much more interesting perhaps, you know, thinking about decentralization that's never really getting us where we need to be. Should we have more of a foresight capacity in the, the mayors and the, and the tribal leaders and communities in order to have them thinking ahead as well about how to, how to manage change? Is that good enough? I think that's where we are. We've got there in a long way around, but that's where we end. Super, that's great. Okay, yes, please. Neighbors don't, uh, uh, do not go to, to present. So uh, I would like just to mention, you know, in, the in, this, uh, in the beginning we discussed the major trends like climate, migration, and so forth, but then we also turn to a sort of bottom-up disruptions, and the one is that uh, I come from Germany, that we have no cities in Germany that start to stop specific cars entering the cities because the pollution is too high. So and imagine that more and more cities decide not to let cars into the center of the cities. That was definitely cause a disruptive development in urban development. And the second issue we dived in is the fear that the trust in public institutions and political and democratic processes may collapse within a couple of years. And that might have a major impact of the way our societies work. Okay, super. I think we're right on time. So I'm, okay, one last one. Go ahead. I 
Yeah, so I, I was also chatting with them, and, and yes, I agree with, with uh, those trends, but I think that the main takeaway of the exercise for us was that how kind of um, unimaginative we really are. We couldn't really come up with, with any actual uh, weak change signals because all of these trends that we've mentioned, that we've really heard about them for a couple of years. I mean, most of them, are, they're already in the SDGs, so we couldn't really come up with something that was comparable to that um, example you gave us about Uber, I, I cannot really wrap my hand ar head around something that's going on in a small scale right now that could really disrupt our lives like Uber or automation maybe 10 years ago. Yeah. Well, that's great. Thank you. That's a helpful um, segue because I can try and respond to that. But first of all, I mean, I think it would have been a bit unfair to get you, you know, on the spot to, to try and come up with that. But, um, but it is really important for good foresight. We say that, like, in, you know, not too kind of crass expression, but garbage in, garbage out. If you don't do a really good job of this early phase, which we call the scanning phase, the rest of your you know, scenario development and the rest of your foresight process really suffers. So it is important to dedicate a lot of time to it. Um, at my former uh, workplace in Canada, where we would do sort of foresight studies over a year, we would typically spend at least three months at the front you know, looking you know, over days and weeks to find what you talked about. Now, one of the uh, shortcuts for finding weak signals is to identify what are some of the key assumptions. What are some of the assumptions about what's going on, what's likely to continue in the future? Thinking of our policy coherence discussion the other day, what are some of the assumptions about the, the level of trade-offs between different SDG goals? Are these, um, are they likely to continue to have the same relationship or could that be changed by some of the, the technological changes? So the or other, so the key thing, one of, a shortcut is to identify what's an assumption that you have that you all agree with, that you think is highly likely, and then to s flip that assumption, the assumption reversal, and say, okay, what's the opposite of that assumption, and can we find any signs that would support the opposite of this, the assumption? So that's just one of the ways that can really kind of help you to zoom in and find uh, weak signals that haven't yet been considered. That said, even when you do take some of the trends that we've been hearing about already, they haven't necessarily all been thought through in terms of just where they could lead to, where they could grow, and what some of their implications are. And often people will, will look to sort of the first or second order consequences of some of these changes, but not go further and think through what the, the, the multiple further order consequences could be and what some of the interactions are. And that's also where as strategic foresight we do cross impacting. I mean, even something like, you know, two big well-known megatrends like population aging and climate change, we haven't necessarily done all the thinking we need to to think about the various scenarios for each of those and how they might interact in surprising ways in, in 10, 15, 20 years. So that was a little bit, thanks for that, that prompt. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in now to the, uh, the next part of my presentation, which is then going to um, set up for the next interactive exercise with Kat after the break. So, um, yes, so as I mentioned, we, uh, one of the exercises that we've done at the OECD over the last year is to uh, work on this piece that's still evergreen, still in development, called Scenarios for Digital Transformation. And this is part of a broader initiative now that the OECD is working on called Going Digital, which is really looking at the digital transformation and its impact across all ranges of, of policy. I think there's over a, a hundred different initiatives at the OECD looking at that now uh, across a range of dimensions. But what our particular niche was to come in and say, well, what... Let, what are the discussions that aren't happening potentially because they're they're sort of not they're not safe they're they're too um, too provocative they're outside of the box or they're they're cutting across different silos of different issues so we really said well let's come in and try and shake up the thinking a little bit and do that by helping people imagine uh, what if the the digital transformation happened faster and deeper and further than expected what could some of the um, that what could some of the impacts of that be? So we identified the critical uncertainties, some of the alternative plausible scenarios, and then of course the whole point of this is to bring it back to the implications for policies. So I'm gonna do a really quick run through of just our, our logic um, around this to help stimulate your thinking. And so of course, where do we start is, well, what is the digital transformation? And there, you've probably s all seen lots of versions of this, which is just pointing to the whole range of technologies that are moving very, very quickly right now. Uh, at the center uh, is artificial intelligence, which uh, even the experts in artificial intelligence continue to be surprised at just the, the pace of um, 
unexpected change uh, in that field. But also um, all these, these related pieces um, from cloud computing, the Internet of Things, devices, synthetic biology, whoops, I'm missing one up at the top that must have not <laughs> moved over, um, mixed reality, sort of virtual reality and augmented reality, uh, the blockchain, of course, and uh, robotics. Um, so what's, what's really fascinating is how all of these technologies are coming together as a, to create an ecosystem or a, really a sort of an infrastructure on which a new global economy is being built on, which new uh, forms of society are being built too. And so we, we jumped off that sort of technological basis and then we asked ourselves, okay, now we push some of those trends into the future and, um, and asked what if um, we had sort of sooner than expected a rapid development of a number of these pieces. What could that lead to? So these are not predictions, but there were some sort of common assumptions just to push people's thinking out. And so we started with saying, well, what if we had universal connectivity uh, of everybody in the whole world by 2030 and probably sooner, but, you know, has a device, at least the, like what we all have in our hands today, um, and at least some way to charge it. They may not still not have uh, running water to their homes, but they likely the whole world will have that. That fundamentally gives everyone a window into um, work and learning opportunities around the world. What if, um, as a result of that in part, um, we see digital business models disrupting most industries, like we've seen in, obviously, um, in, in media and in transportation and mobility and in a number of areas already, what happens if this, if this sort of expands out? What if we see physical production increasingly going local and increasingly being automated with uh, 3D printing and also the circular economy that somebody was mentioning earlier? Um, what if uh, most of global trade is in fact in digital files and not in physical products? What if most internet users, this one's almost guaranteed, or by definition are going to be in Asia and Africa? What are the impacts of that? How does it change the world? Of course, you know, a larger, older, healthier population, and also uh, the potential for highly decentralized energy, uh, renewable energy, um, as we see the growth of, of solar and, and wind and uh, decreasing prices of electricity storage as well. So we started from that and we said, okay, but then given that, what are the different ways that this could go? What are the different trajectories we could see? What are some of the, the key critical uncertainties? And we named uh, a bunch of them. So we, we did, I should step back to tell you that, I mean, this, this whole process involved a number of people from across the OECD. We started by doing a process uh, similar to what we did just with you know, now this morning, where we identified some of the elements of change. And then we, we kind of grouped these. And then we asked ourselves, what are some of the key critical uncertainties within these? And I won't go through them all, but, you know, one of the key ones is the first one I mentioned here that, that came back to is like who controls the data in all of this? Like data is, uh, is viewed now uh, as being very, you know, as, as uh, fundamental to creating value in this digital economy. And whoever controls that data therefore has a degree of power in this economy. And so is, are we going to be in a world where citizens and individuals demand greater control of their own data, as we're seeing now potentially in uh, you know, the, what's uh, widely termed the, the, the tech lash or you know, a backlash towards some of the privacy concerns we've seen around social media in recent years? Um, are we going to see governments taking a much larger role in, in data themselves as they try to reassert their position, in particular in relation to the, the large corporations where they're seeing that, you know, governments are seeing that without the data, they really don't have the capacity to respond to citizen needs. Do we, uh, do we see um, corporations really continuing to have a, a dominant position in, in gathering up and accessing that data? Or finally, um, could we see a world where actually data, rather than being scarce, uh, becomes so ubiquitous, so commonly available, that nobody can really control or monopolize it, and in fact that we have a, it enables a highly, highly decentralized system. So data is not actually the new oil, it's the new air. And this, uh, you know, it's a potential trend where we're emerging where that, you know, within, um, and then 5, 10, 15 years, you know, you walk down the street and there are so many cameras and sensors uh, capturing your image and detecting who you are and, and spreading that information out through a number of services around the world that really, you know, the, the data set of, of who's in New York um, today, uh, with whom going where in what mood is something that is, is really um, uh, open and uh, easily available. And that along with, um, with enabling really a, a sort of more decentralized economy. So I won't go through the, the rest of these, but obviously you're familiar with some of them, you know, around the technological employment being low or high. And, um, 
And our, our main point is that saying for policy making, what it's essential to do is instead of uh, saying, well, we don't know, experts don't agree, so we'll say it's probably somewhere down the middle. And we're saying, actually, that's not the responsible thing to do in policy making. That's not the responsible assumption to make when you're, you're doing your SDG planning. You actually need to say, really, what are the plausible extremes on each of these critical uncertainties? And let's make sure that our policies now are ready for that, are anticipating, are preparing for, for what those alternatives could be. So to make a long story short, we roll all of these up into uh, four scenarios, and the, I will, um, and, and they have a number of different layers and different dimensions, which will, I won't have time to get through, go through now, but just to, uh, I'll mention one sort of key point that might relate to um, the set us up for our cities and communities discussion for each of these that then we'll come back to in Kat's session. So the, the first is I choose, and this is uh, one where we, um, we extrapolate, you know, what if every human has this digital window to free unlimited virtual education, work, and society? So, and particularly for communities, so what if people can actually work and learn from anywhere in the world, and as a result, potentially urbanization slows and communities compete for residents on the basis um, of quality for life? So, People in the middle pay real attention to what Duncan says for scenario two. The people on this side pay attention to scenario three, and the people on the outside pay real attention to scenario four. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for reminding me, Kat. Perfect. So, that, so, sir, do you have a question? and creative foresight. Was this meant for one in particular? Um, I wouldn't actually. I think there are lots of different definitions and I think Arndt's one about those four categories is very interesting. But I think this one is, uh, we would call this strategic foresight. It's more aimed at, yeah, I suppose it would fit more in the second category, strategic foresight. It's really not designed so much for the vis visioning and the, the world we want, but more for what is the potential worlds that we could be facing. So then you can bring that back and say, now how does that impact our plans, our strategies, and what it is that, you know, and how do we achieve what we want in under each of those scenarios to make sure that our plans. So yeah, I think that's, but th thanks for the question. Okay, so scenario one, two, two is the whole um, horseshoe, and then three, and then four. Okay, so I hope you caught that scenario one. We can, I'll come back and, uh, and, and tell you more afterwards. But yeah, think through that, that idea. This is a world where, um, where everyone has, you know, what are the implications of everybody being connected in the world to that? And what does that mean for communities? Um, second, we have one where, uh, which we're already seeing uh, with governments such as China, but also India where, and, and Estonia, others where governments, rather than staying out of the digital transformation, are playing a highly active role, saying we are going to drive, we're going to lead, but we're also going to um, see ourselves as being somewhat of the platforms uh, in, and not just leave that to the, the corporation's role and, um, and actually play an active role in helping to build the digital transformation. So what if um, we're saying here, what, what if countries go that way? What if they sort of take a, an active approach to sort of take complete forms of virtual and digital government at the national level? What could that mean for, for communities and for cities in that? The third one is around, uh, we're calling it corporate connectors. And so this is really an extrapolation of some of the trends that we are seeing now, but what if they went, if they continue to grow? What if we saw ourselves in 10 to 15 years, we found ourselves with sort of uh, most of the global digital economy being dominated by six to eight large global players. Of course, you know, we're familiar with uh, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon in the West, but also uh, the emerging uh, tech giants out of China as well. Maybe there'll be some new ones. Um, but what happens if there's really a consolidation of activity there around these uh, digital platforms? And um, for cities, what if you know these platforms are kind of competing to bring cities and communities into their respective smart city platforms? What opportunities and challenges does that create for communities? 
And then finally, uh, this is the one I referred to later when I said, you know, what if actually uh, data becomes so abundant, um, but also not only data, but also access to artificial intelligence, which after all is just software. So what if that is that we have open source artificial intelligence and, and all the data you could need and, and neither governments nor corporations can actually keep a monopoly on this and it's enabling a number of small actors to, to become involved in a highly competitive uh, decentralized digital economy but this is also one where, you know, critically the coordination functions that were pre previously performed by governments and firms are now performed instead by multiple artificial intelligences linked together through uh, decentralized networks uh, enabled by the blockchain and so forth. So this is really sort of, you know, shakes up some of our assumptions uh, about where um, power and control will be concentrated in the world to come. And the point about these four scenarios is we really don't know which which way. I mean, all of these seem plausible in terms of uh, where the world could be headed. And so they're really just a tool to help us think through now what the implications could be. Uh, the goal is that we're not, we'll be a lot a lot better off having prepared for multiple futures than just having prepared for one. And then even though we know it'll be something completely different that actually happens, we'll still be, um, our, our policies will be more likely to be responsive and adaptive having gone through this exercise. So I'm just gonna, um, just to let you know what we then do, uh, we'll be doing a, a version of this exercise with you with Kat in a minute, but we, will, we take this out to different directorates uh, across the OECD, but also to different countries that we work with, and we work this through, and we say, okay, what, w what would the implications of these scenarios be for you? What new challenges and opportunities does it raise? What are the implications for your decision-making today? In particular, how do you design strategies that would be robust under the various scenarios? So um, just to end, uh, just to point out that uh, we at the OECD provide customized strategic foresight and workshops for uh, national governments to help them with their developing their and implementing their SDG strategies. Also on specific SDGs or thematic issues, we also go and do particular workshops around the, um, the digital transformation scenarios I mentioned. And we're also uh, trying to advise, as all the rest of my colleagues here, um, governments and others, on how to actually build and embed and mainstream that anticipatory capacity within decision-making processes. For more information, don't hesitate to uh, send me an, an email. I think that's it, yes? Okay, so we... Yes, thank you, Duncan. So uh, we thought we would take a break for people to stretch their legs, get something to drink. We will uh, convene back here at 12 o'clock. Now you're not released, you all have to come back because we're using this strategy these various scenarios for the next exercise after lunch. It's coming after lunch, uh, after the break. So we want to hold you in suspense here, and then we will bring you this, this slide again later, also the descriptors. There is also a handout which we need for the next session, so if you want to grab that during the break, and of course we are all around for you to engage with right now in case you're heading out later at one o'clock immediately after our next session. Thanks a lot, everyone. We'll see you at 12.
How is the voice? Voice is okay? Makes me sound as if I'm five kilometers away. It's okay? Well, nice use of the gavel, aunt. Thank you. I formally declare the second part of this session open. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kat Tully, and I was where you sit a few years ago. I was using strategic foresight. I was learning about strategic foresight, and I was using it in governments, with Christian aid, and in the private sector. And what's so interesting about strategic foresight is the fact that with the SDGs, which is a universal, complex, independent, interdependent approach to policy making, we need a governance and policy making approach to match. And that is why strategic foresight is so important. It's why we're so passionate about getting strategic foresight to have impact. And so this is what we're going to spend the next hour doing, is exploring how we take all these concepts that we've discussed, exploring the future, in order to make better decisions today. So we're going to talk about foresight with impact. But before you do, you're going to do a bit more work. OK? So how do you use the scenarios that Duncan discussed in order to make better policies together today? What are some of the tools and the techniques that you can use to generate policy implications? And we are going to do a very quick and dirty taster exercise to give you an insight into one of the many tools that you can use. Because foresight, if it does anything, is about giving you different perspectives instead of looking at the world and its possibilities from the here and the now, you are looking from the future and through the eyes of different people. So we are going to do a personas exercise. You are going to be given a persona. We are going to then look at the scenario that you were given and then you're going to explore what are the emerging opportunities for your person in that scenario. Okay? So does everybody have a handout? Good? Excellent. Here are the personas. Okay? We have a national policy maker. These are all written on your sheet a national policymaker, an entrepreneur, a local policymaker, and a citizen. I'm going to suggest that you, up until this gentleman here, or this lady with a red top, um, you'll be national policymakers, okay? Um, in this, you will be entrepreneurs, okay? Still remember your scenario, you're still scenario two, you're still scenario one. You, up to this gentleman with a very nice jacket, um, is a local policy maker. Okay, you got that? And you are citizens. Now, when we start the exercise, the first thing you'll want to do is to decide which city do you live in? Because bringing that out, that specificity, the context matters, as Riel says. And so let's harness that. And you've also been assigned a scenario. There's a little aid memoir on your sheet. So what you are going to do is going to explore for your persona and your scenario, what are the emerging opportunities for your persona in 2030? Duncan, I believe that you're a local policymaker. And I understand that you're also living in corporate connectors, scenario three. What are some of the uh, 
implications and opportunities for you in 2030 of the scenario that you're in? Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, well, I'm finding it fascinating that uh, I'm on the one hand having pressure on my community, from my community to make sure that we're improving services and being at the cutting edge as a, as a city. Um, on the other hand, I've got all of these large companies coming to tell me that I should uh, buy into their global platforms, that they're the only way that I'm going to be able to do this. And so um, we're facing some, uh, I'm facing what I hope is an opportunity to be able to, um, if I play my cards right, play them off against each other, to, mm -hmm. um, but without necessarily ending up that I've got a Google neighborhood over here and a 10 cent neighborhood over there. And uh, so uh, f figuring this, and maybe there are opportunities for me to work with other cities so that we can try and uh, really make sure that this serves uh, the interests of my, my citizens. Thank you very much, local policymaker. Right, got it? Okay, you have seven minutes, and then we'll report back. Yep, let's put the scenarios back. Oh, yeah, that's, that's right. So you're a, a, you're a person in a city with a scenario. What are the opportunities? And Kat, what are the group sizes?
Ladies and gentlemen, I hate to break into these conversations, but I'm going to invite you to come back into plenary. Ladies and gentlemen, please can you get in your time capsules and return from 2030 to 2018. Thank you. I pay tribute to you all for uh, getting really stuck into the exercise. Energy levels, a little bit uncertain to begin with, but within five minutes, boy, did you get into it. So I would like to invite a group to take 30 seconds to give key feedback on what were some of the implications for their persona in their city in 2030. Anybody want to volunteer? Thank you. Oh, All right. Oh, I can use this. Doesn't matter. Maybe it's that I'll stay. Um, okay. Um, so we are. I'm the persona. I'm the uh, consumer, and Which I live. City are you in? Huh? Which city? Are you in? I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm the consumer. I live in the bustling, a future-oriented city of Accra, the capital of Ghana, um, that has been growing you know, economically and, and socially very rapidly over the last uh, few decades. And I'm uh, living in scenario three, which is in a way the, the, corporate, the corporate scenario. And so I'm living in an environment that has a lot of opportunities, including economic ec opportunities. Um, Accra has become a smart city. However, that is very much monopolized by very few corporations um, that are in a way running the infrastructure and the services um, of, of that city. So um, some of the um, implications uh, for me um, are that it enables me in a way to um, completely, the complete uh, com transportation and commuting infrastructure has been changed. In fact, I don't even need to live in Accra anymore. I can live in the beautiful countryside in Ghana where I'm telecommuting um, um, to my high paying job as a corporate manager um, um, in one of those corporations. And my life is greatly enhanced by a number of um, very, very low paid, um, very low paid um, 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 people who are, who are in a way supporting my life because in my city, unfortunately, there's very large um, income, income inequality because there are lots of high paying corporate jobs and then there are a, a, a huge vast number of very, very low paying, low skilled kind of job that in a way propping up my very, very futuristic smart city. Many thanks indeed. And anybody else a citizen or in scenario three? You are in scenario three. And who are you? South Africa, and uh, uh, it used to be pretty good. There are three, three and a half million people living there, and uh, a lot of technology had been introduced by the government. And um, uh, we even had, uh, with, with one message sent to a particular number, we could get things set right. Let's say a traffic light is not working, or there's a leakage. In, of water in one of the roads, and one message would set things right. But then the new government has uh, uh, in, uh, changed the system, and a small number of global tech corporations have become the intermediaries now, and then uh, uh, they're ruling over uh, everything. And since there are only a few of them, the prices of everything has gone up, and it's become very expensive for uh, the uh, ordinary individual to afford things. And and it, it's not the ideal situation to be in. Okay. Only uh, parts of the cities are growing and the, the, the remaining parts are not. Uh, there's a scenario, uh, actually a short of time. <laughs> this is all very, well, very, very yeah. nice, thank you. And you, you displayed the kind of two sides of the same coin, so thank you. Some nice implications. Can I invite um, another group to share perhaps in 30 seconds some of the implications uh, from their scenario? You can say who you are, what scenario you're in, and what city you are in, please.
We're in, um, uh, we're representing New York, uh, seeing as we're in the city today. Um, we're very much building off the scenario that you discussed because we're local policy makers um, looking at the corporate connectors environment. Um, as you know, in New York here, we do have a lot of corporates here who are willing to engage in, um, in sort of making New York building on what it is and making it more of a sort of smart city. But that comes both with an opportunity, but also a risk in that there's a lot of conflict of interest um, and uh, corporates sort of vying to participate. We also discussed a little bit the struggle in bringing um, corporates together to, towards a sort of more common vision for the city because uh, they obviously have their own interests and, and what they're sort of interested in and we as local policy makers have to consider the needs of our communities as well. Um, with, in that context as well, the communities in, in New York obviously would like a very sort of smart city to be available, but New York is a city with high levels of inequality um, where not there's a sort of bit of a digital divide. Not everyone has access to tech. And so we have to be mindful when we bring corporates together of how we can make sure that there is um, a bit uh, enhanced access, if you like, so that we can make our city truly work as one. Another area that we sort of saw um, as an opportunity, but it's, it's got an upside and a downside, is that it's an opportunity to upgrade the infrastructure in the city. It's obviously a city which has been you know, at the forefront of development in the world for many, many years, but a lot of its infrastructure is somewhat outdated. Um, and it does, as a city, have uh, funding constraints in terms of what it can do, particularly given the sort of structure of funding between federal and state funding and changes that have happen been happening in, that, um, in recent years. Can I years. stop you there? Thank you very much. I definitely want to give the floor to some of these groups on this side who discussed... Scenario one, I believe. Scenario one, uh, we are living in Madrid, Spain. Uh, I, we think that this scenario one means... And you are a... And we are national government, national policy makers, sorry. So um, we think that that scenario means that people would rather uh, start moving away from the city and living out of the city and choosing other ways of... Uh, uh, working so more decentralization will come will come and that will be a positive for the country because other places will be will have uh, more population uh, it will be a positive development and the government need will need to provide and to think in advance infrastructure and transportation needs for different communities and other and other cities to enable that uh, happening this will also bring some competition between between other cities to attract that population um, and finally, this also may mean uh, decreasing the income for the, for the city of Madrid and some mechanisms to compensate that some infrastructure or if it's uh, too big now or some services if they are too extended can be moved away to different places or, or changed. So many thanks. I've been told by my fellow um, facilitators that I must move on. So apologies to the last group for not giving you the floor. But what I've really enjoyed hearing is the fact that you've identified risks as well as opportunities, as well as implications. There are themes that are coming out across the different scenarios. And if we had more time, we could get into this in more detail. So what I would like to spend a few minutes talking about now is how you use the scenarios for policy making. Here are three examples of different scenarios with implications for cities from government, business, and international organizations. So in the middle is some work that we did for Oman 2040 for their national development plan. Now, they're also looking at their national spatial strategy, urbanization policy at the same time. So how should they plan that strategy for a world which could be so different, whether it's migration, because 50% of the population is from abroad, whether it's from uh, carbon change and diversification of the economy, is it going to be still oil dependent or very differently technologically enabled? And what about climate change? Because so many of the cities in the Middle East may well be unlivable a few months of the year 
by 2040, including affecting the Hajj. Now, let me turn now to IATA, the International Aviation Transportation Authority. We did a classic two by two to create scenarios out to 2035. And the two uncertainties that we did the scenarios around was the extent to which new governance, multilateral governance, happens as we shift geopolitically to the east, but also that point around data that Duncan brought out. To what extent is data going to be owned and by whom, or is it owned by everyone? Is it like air? But what was interesting is that in every single scenario, the relationship of aviation companies with urban planners became critical. Now, we'll talk about this later, but effectively it was a capacity and it was a relationship that they needed to build to be resilient for all future scenarios. And then let me turn you to UN Habitat, where they have excellent work doing urban planning models, which relies on straight line trends of urbanization. But what happens when urbanization reverses, like in Zimbabwe, or there's a shock and disruption to the system, like a climate change impact. We need, to have think, uh, we need to think through how to plan and how to prepare for that. So in um, UN Habitat with their India office, very much started to prepare for how can you actually look at what could be quite a scary scenario, which is the baseline scenario, where you have under a billion people by 2040 living in cities and that the top 10 out of 20 cities, polluted cities in the world or in India. How can you turn that baseline case into a new vision, into a new scenario, into changing, moving away from this business as usual trajectory from a much better future? And it's in harnessing these tools. Can we go to the next slide? and it's in harnessing these tools. The next slide, I'm going to show you a quote by the UN Secretary General. We live in an uncertain, volatile world. We need to use these tools and techniques in order to help us achieve the sustainable development goals. But it's not just as a technocratic exercise. The power of scenarios and the power of strategic foresight is at the core of development because it is about agency. It is about the depiction of your desired future. So I use Wakanda too, but I use it as a positive story. This is the power of people coming together and saying, we can create a different future. So that the power of communities coming together collaboratively to discuss what their futures can look like is a deeply political act of agency in a world of turbulence and where political systems aren't always successfully listening to those at the periphery. It is core to the act of leaving no one behind is to go and listen to the communities and to help build those processes that enable communities to think about their future. And the Philippines and, the, and Indonesia do this excessively well at scale. So, very quickly, you can depict the future all you like in your scenarios, but how do you then use that? Um, you use it for vision. You create a positive view of where you want to get to. You harness people's energies but you also use it to manage risk. You're aware that the future will not develop in the way that you want it to. So you need to be aware. You shouldn't be blindsided by risks. You should be scanning the horizon and be prepared with contingency plans and ready to pick up on early warning indicators. This is what anticipatory government is about. You don't use indicators from the past, like a rear view mirror. You look through the windscreen act the future. And finally, neither the future we hope for nor the one that we fear 
in our stories that we depict are ever going to come to pass. They, it is a fantasy. It's a story we tell ourselves. It's an imaginative endeavor that we're on. But the fundamental thing is by conducting this um, imaginative endeavor, we become more agile, responsive, and are able to respond to the future as it evolves. Here are some tools. There's a, we've talked very little about tools so far, but there are a lot of tools in the strategic foresight domain. And to help you achieve those goals of vision, risk management, and agility, there's a lot of them. Visioning, you bring people together to create your desired future. Wind tunneling is what I just said um, about the IATA scenarios. What are the capabilities that are resilient in all different scenarios. How can we use those? What are, uh, how good is my current organizational structure for the kind of futures that I'm gonna face? Let's test our current strategies against the possible futures and backcasting. Now, what we've done is we've talked a lot about ordering, which is depicting different futures and that's where 90% of a lot of activity stays. It's like hanging out there in 2030. And sometimes we think about implications. But, and this is why I'm so glad that so many of the questions earlier started touching on this, the million dollar question is how do you integrate that into your organization, into your local, um, local government planning, at the national level, in your communities, because otherwise those are interesting insights that don't get acted on. And here are some examples of organizations that have done it well in NYC. They've actually adopted the SDG framework into their planning processes and they're actually using um, different ways. Uh, the interesting thing is when you use budgeting, for example, behind your strategic foresight exercises, making sure that any uh, disbursement has to be tested against possible scenarios of the future. And here are, is a way of thinking about how you can integrate it into your organization. Think about how you communicate your values as an organization. Do you think about the future? Is being future focused a core value? What about the processes, not just financing, but performance management? Are you recruiting the right people? So these are all things to bear in mind when you're actually really trying to take exercises about the future and embed it into your organizations. Now, one of the ways of taking a first step as an organization uh, to think about the future is by setting up a scanning network. And this is something that we're doing identifying next generation foresight practitioners from the global south who are doing very interesting work indeed in their communities and who are scanning weak signals. So the deadline for this prize has just passed but we're running the competition again next year and this is effectively a scanning network of innovators who are, whether it's in Nigeria, Turkey, Brazil, in the UK, really thinking about and spotting the changes and the drivers of change. Another way of, within your organization, of also being perhaps a little bit more future prepared is by engaging some of the younger members of staff. And it's at this point that I want to hand over to Osge, who has basically been running one of the uh, new networks at the UN uh, running something called the Young UN, bringing together under 30-year-olds, exploring the future, facing the UN. Thank you so much. I mean, first of all, thanks so much, Kat, to give us this opportunity to give you a one or two minutes just of a glimpse of what we are um, trying to achieve or sort of the, the way we have embarked on as the young UN in the, in the scope and of the realm of, of, let's say, thinking differently and thinking uh, with a perspective that is more forward-looking. 
Um, the Young UN, and I must give credit also to other colleagues sitting here in the room, is, is a broad network that was uh, initiated by a couple of different people. Um, um, where I am much more, um, where I'm more engaged on is a, a, s a special group that is sort of called the Working Group on Frontier Issues, and where we have been, what we have been trying to do in that group is actually what Kat is, you know, sort of explaining and has been talking about for the past two hours, trying to understand how can we mainstream or integrate sort of the DNA of foresight into the way how the UN works, and we have had the chance to um, maybe just maybe looking back into what um, Kat has presented, what is the Young UN, how do we come in? I think the Young UN, uh, the beauty of it, it's, it's a network. Um, we are an agile organization, and in order to be able to look forward, you have to have an agility, and that, that's what basically the network brings in. We are flat, we are collaborative, and we are trying to work across silos in the way how we operate, meaning it's, it's, it's an opportunity to join, or it gives an opportunity to join uh, for different people working in different agencies, thinking about topics that are cross-agency and maybe even cross their own uh, work that they do on a daily basis. It's basically a network that is, um, that is a structure that um, initiates ideas, that runs ideas and tries to test also new approaches. And, and one thing that we have done lately is a visioning exercise. And I would say this is where we have been maybe coming the closest to the sort of the foresight work um, in the context of the HLCP. Um, the High Level Committee on Programs, and I was a member that just left, in, in an exercise that was about understanding the future we want in, inside the UN, basically. And what we have done there is really a crowdsourcing of ideas. We have posted a couple of questions to the network, and we have gotten some really interesting ideas back. And this is it's, it's what also Kat said. In order to understand you know, how the future is, we, want, we need to vision it. We need to think about it in a very creative way. And these are the ideas we have gotten back from the network, basically. So when you look at the different colors, the white is the future we want, and the black is the future we might have if we don't do anything about it in terms of new policies, new adaptive and new sort of forward-looking policies. And some of the very interesting things that we have come across is, and I think these are also things that we are uh, talking about in the context of the UN is we have to do things differently. When we talk, for, ex for instance, about economic models, you have to be much more sustainable, look into circular ways of doing economy and, and, and ideas like that. And I think um, moving forward, and what we would like to do is, you we would like to be in a way a bit of a model how the UN could work in the future. Let's say be an agile network rather than being siloed, look into opportunities to work across agencies, look into opportunities to work across maybe even uh, work streams um, on an issue-based, um, I would say, approach. And then come back also with um, propositions of how to do things differently from the field. Because I think the beauty of the network is, is a South component that Kat outlined. It's, of course, I mean, we have a coordination group sitting in New York, but we are working very closely with a vast, net, vast network of young UN people sitting in Bangkok, in Nairobi, in Geneva. And the ideas are being basically run through to the network through also these different um, regional offices and the field. And, um, and maybe this is also just a call just to finish to use the network to run your ideas if you have you know an initiation of a, of a of a process of a, of a, of a new innovative thinking you can use the network to sort of test these ideas and get back feedback on this yeah thank you many thanks indeed and um, my time is coming to a close and the interesting thing about strategic foresight exercises is that we like to change the tempo a lot i'm perhaps uh, revealing the curtain and the Wizard of Oz behind it. But what we do is make it very engaging. Lots of opportunities and spaces for different types of conversations and different types of exercises that will work for different types of people. And we tend to use a process of divergence and then convergence of space where we get a lot of interaction and then a space for personal reflection. So I am going to use these last 90 seconds of my session to invite you individually to close your eyes and to think about the answers to these two questions. You have spent three hours here listening to some of the greatest thinkers of how strategic foresight can play out in the sustainable development goal field. 
So my challenge to you is please spend these 90 seconds to think, so what? What's the one thing that you've taken out of today? And now what? What's the one thing you're going to do differently? Okay? So your 90 seconds starts now. Okay, well, thank you very much for following instructions so beautifully. I saw a lot of you with your eyes closed. Um, thank you very much, and I think now we've got some nice time to have a few Q&As. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Kat. That was a really nice exercise to prepare us for the Q&A. Uh, maybe even some reflections from people on what they would like to do. Uh, so we have until one o'clock to do that and of course if you want to talk to any of us individually afterwards we'll be around for a little bit longer. But does anyone have a question or comment to make about the last few sessions? Yes please. of you could uh, listen to what I said. Um, as you work, at least part of you, with OECD, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I came across the OECD economic survey on Germany. And bringing together this document with the discussion we just had, I question myself uh, and then ask myself, how can we link the work we are discussing here with all the long-term strategic thinking that is going on in other silos. Because if you take a look of this OECD document that looks deep into German economic performance, there is not one word mentioning the Agenda 2030. At the same time, when the CEO of the OECD is giving high talks on this issue in international fora. So how do you link these approaches to the work within your institutions, to the other silos you meet at least in the cafeteria? Great, great question. And I think um, without, you know, singling out any colleagues, uh, you know, within the OECD who I don't feel aren't, you know, taking up the, the foresight uh, or the SDG mantle for that, that matter. I mean, I think it's it's kind of inevitable, inevitable at the OECD and it's probably inevitable in all of our organizations. And I think that um, that really is, I mean, you put your finger on it as the challenge. It is, I see our role in the, my role in the OECD and some of my colleagues as well about really bringing about a culture change. Uh, I mean, just speaking to the foresight part first, I think it, there's, we've all grown up in organizations thinking that what we need to do to do good analysis is conduct a diagnostic and um, come up with one's regional, reasonable expectations about what the future is going to be and then make recommendations. And it is actually much more difficult and much more uncomfortable to have to say, actually, we, we need to come up with multiple scenarios of what, what the diagnostic could be. Because the diagnostic that matters isn't what happened six months ago. It's about the, the, the time that your policies are going to be having an effect on, and that's invariably in the future. And this has always been true, but as we are entering a 
phase of human history where change is arguably accelerating and it's on an unprecedented kind of global scale, it's, it's really more important than ever that we, we devote more attention and effort to doing this. But that isn't easy and people, everyone has their own jobs that they do in the sort of the same ways and actually taking this on board is, uh, is challenging. I think you know, the same could be said for those who are trying to push through the culture of, uh, of really integrating not just the SDGs but a, a coherent and integrated approach and consideration of the SDGs as well. And so um, all I would, would say to you is that, um, you know, implore all of you who've been with us the last three hours to be ambassadors for this cause. Um, there, there are a lot, there's a lot of complexity. There are a lot of different methods and tools that you can adopt. But you can also boil it down to one core simple idea that, I mean, if you go in, if, to, if, if you're meeting with a group of colleagues on any policy issue, on any strategy, and say, okay, what what are some of the ways that the future could be different from what we're expecting, and how could that impact our policy? I mean, even if you just start with that core question, you're making a huge step to, to, to doing it. And then the more one gets into it, then the more you build on with new tools. But uh, that's certainly what I'm continuing to, uh, to champion, both within um, in the OECD and with our, our uh, colleagues in governments as well. Pick up the point on Germany, actually, because Germany is a very interesting example for two reasons. Uh, first of all, is the fact that BMZ, the development agency, has been spearheading the use of strategic foresight um, across the agency. Um, so that's a really nice case study to examine in the different ways that you can do studies, you can build internal capability, and how you start stress testing development policy. The other interesting uh, reason that um, the other reason why Germany is very interesting is because um, in the coalition agreement five years ago there was a, a strong commitment to strategic foresight which kicked off a cross ministerial process um, and now a new strategic foresight unit has been created in the chancellery um, in Chancellor Merkel's office to, to spearhead this approach it's a whole of government approach which the development policy is part of that Thanks, Kat. Before I take the next comment or question, just to mention our feedback uh, questionnaire. It's online at this link. We would really appreciate if you could give us your details there, your email, because we do want to uh, share with you after this the presentation and give you access to the material, but also hear from you how you found this course and what we can do better. Okay, over to the next question. Yes. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, it's a little bit further, um, or continuing on the previous question, and in the age of Trumpism and the, the rise of populism, uh, the way we have seen uh, anti-science, even anti-rationality, taking hold of a lot of uh, the governments that we have to deal with, uh, how do you see that trend within a, 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 the, 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 the strategic forecast um, community? if I can say, um, and, and what do you make of it? How do you explain it and how do you confront it? Because that's going exactly in the opposite direction of what, has, what you, you are advocating and proposing as tools for rational planning and adaptive, adaptive planning. And yet uh, we see part of the world and, and going in the, in the opposite direction in a very, uh, in a very um, distressful way. It's an important question and it's an important theme. Uh, uh, 38 years ago, so let's see, in 1980, um, I was studying command planning down the road from here at the New School for Social Research. I spent an entire year uh, looking at how China uh, controlled its economy uh, and attempted to create policy coherence. <laughs> um, and subsequently, as uh, an advisor to governments and as somebody who's worked in the civil service at national, international, local levels. Um, I've also heard us often exclaim the importance of coherence and the crucial role of science and rationality. Um, I think there's a symptom perhaps here that calls into question that perspective. Um, I think that the idea that we're going to be able to create coherence, rationality, and, and control that we're going to be able to uh, integrate 
the vastness through some brilliant or huge uh, effort um, is misplaced. Uh, reality doesn't fall apart. Uh, reality does not actually, in my view, and I think it's, this is the, become more or less complex, it is complex. It is emergent as a complex evolving assemblage, not a totality. We are entangled. We're relational. We're not objectified. We're moving beyond objectification ontologies to relational ontologies, where we are part of everything and everything is part of us. These seem to me to imply some changes in the basic way in which we conceptualize how things happen and how we play a role in how things happen. And so if there's some pushback because people are disappointed that the effort to create coherence, which I have uh, you know, experienced personally as a civil servant dozens of times, um, maybe that pushback is trying to say something about the pretension of the rationalist enlightenment project. Uh, and this is, this is a profound and difficult issue, and we're in a period which many people would characterize as a period of transition in that sense. Some certainties and some existing systems are in decline, are in disrepute, are ineffective. And so the challenge becomes, it seems to me, uh, to, to not reject that, and from that point of view, populism is popular, and say, how can we rethink the foundation of our approach to addressing these issues? Now, that doesn't mean we throw the baby out with the bathwater, and a transition doesn't happen overnight. It takes a long time, often. So I just, I just think that, that we need to be very careful in, in how we respond to that. And as much as we can be urged to redouble our efforts at coherence, redouble our efforts at connecting up, which in and of itself is not bad. Improvement is always good. There's nevertheless another issue uh, that sort of came up kind of implicitly, I think, in the, in the, in the youth uh, saying, let's go, let, what, what about these silos? Aren't these silos a bit of a problem? Now, silos are very effective if you want to create direct linkages and say one plus two plus three, and you can connect them up and you can create a very rational plan. But if you go non-silo, how does coherence happen? It doesn't. It's a different way of creating connectivity and creating spontaneity and engagement. And it implies a different role, less, less hubris on the part of humans, uh, and more kind of ability to surf, as was put into one of the slides here. So I'm not, I'm not kind of trying to be negative or reject the question. I just think we need to enlarge our way of looking in order to understand what's going on. I, I agree with you, and I'm the first to criticize our obsession or illusion with positivity and, and, and trying to, to rest too much. Um, yet, you know, postmodernity has been around for 50 years, and it didn't always take that uh, anti-rational anti or anti-science uh, perspective into populism. Populism has been, has been around for much more than 50 years and hasn't always given, uh, resulted into the, what we're seeing now. Um, so we still need to explain why it's taking the form it is taking now, because it, it, it does have tremendous consequences on what we're trying to do at a very critical time. So we need to, better, to be able to better understand it and, 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 and tackle it, not necessarily going to the other extreme of, of the positivist uh, uh, you know, uh, enlightenment obsessions or illusions to, to the extreme, but uh, we, need, we need to be better able to, to tackle it nevertheless. Yeah, I think we're all nodding over here. That's, that's right. Yeah, please. because I think it's important to look at the macro level. But I think what is also very important is look at the micro level, right? And I think when you look at, I mean, I'm not talking here in the head of, or on the head of my agency where I work for with UNICEF, but we do have, um, for instance, I used to have a strategic foresight unit, which did some really incredible work and very, you know, interesting, creative, I would say, thinking for the organization. But I do not believe that from an incentive point of view, or let's say from a political buy-in point of view, that was really supported. And my question then on a very practical basis is actually, A, how to incentivize people 
to use foresight in their everyday jobs. I mean, there are, of course, some of us that have the luxury to work on this on a full-time basis, but some others not. But they're still impacted and should be impacted by it as a thinking. And then also, I think, in an organization, because change at the, let's say, regional, global level also should be happening bottom-up, right? So by creating maybe change in some of the smaller or, you know, organizations, you can have a better or a positive impact moving forward is how to change these organizations from within, perhaps, to become more agile. And maybe, you know, the Young UN is a example of doing this. It's connecting people across different departments, across different groups and so on. But I think organizations in the UN also need to learn how to do that better because we are being labeled still. And again, these things are happening in some, you know, very specific bits and parts of the system, but not really mainstream throughout the system. I think we have to become better at that, if I may say, yeah. Thank you. If I can respond to that, I, I think the UNICEF case is a very sad one. I mean, you had a team, now it is gone. Uh, I want to share an analogy that a friend of mine came up with who used to be a foresight practitioner, like a foresight expert in the Singapore government, and who, because of all these uh, movements that civil servants have to make in Singapore, was moved into a totally different department, and who became responsible for the Formula One and the tennis tournaments and so on in Singapore. He figured out that he could actually learn something from this new environment, and he compares in his descriptions the foresight um, value chain to a Formula One team where you have the people who are the mechanics who have to deal with the now, who have to just act in, in a big organization, who have to constantly you know, fix the wheels and so on and so forth. Then the people who are you know, doing the, the planning, who are looking at, okay, uh, we need to buy XYZ technology to make this car faster and so on and so forth. And then there are the managers who are sitting uh, you know, on top and who have to make decisions about where this investment will go and so on. So everybody has their own role in terms of making this team effort work, but if communication breaks down with, among any of these teams, nothing works. And that's also the dilemma for a lot of the foresight teams. They're just not able to communicate their amazing insights to the now people. And they're not able to communicate their amazing insights to the decision makers, the managers. If that happens, the whole thing doesn't have any value. So what you're pointing out is, you know, inside an organization, if you're a foresight team, if you have a dedicated team, if that is not connected to the rest in a very good way, and you have people who are communicators, then the whole thing isn't worth a lot of uh, effort. Now, we're not saying necessarily, I think we would all agree, that you need to have a team dedicated to foresight. It's not a must. In fact, we're usually saying everybody should be futures literate. Everybody should have a bit of this. But, you know, put yourself into the shoes of the now person uh, they don't have much time to spend on, on, on other things. But they should be aware that when they see something happening, that's a signal I have to tell the planner guy. I'm sensing, even though I'm in the now, I'm sensing something that's relevant for the other time zone that people are in, in my team. The futures, or whatever. That's just a quick reaction to this. Real? I, I, just, I just have a little, little thought. We don't have a lot of time. But I mean, think about it like statistics. These days, statistics is, are used by everybody, everywhere. Nobody says, oh, we're going to you know, specialize in statistics, and then we're going to create a statistics team, and then we're going to abolish them. Statistics is just a constant, because it's a way of describing and understanding the world around us, and everybody understands that it's got a utility in their particular domain. Um, I think in the, we're moving towards a situation where understanding anticipatory systems and the practices related to describing imaginary futures will become much more universal. So everybody knows how to read and write, and they use it for different things. Some of them use it for strategy, some of it use it for implementation, some of it use it for poetry, some of it use it for nasty things. In that sense, as we move towards a more futures literate context, it becomes integrated into everything we do. Uh, but we're in some ways only at the beginning of that. Colleagues, we're, we're out of time. I know there's some more questions, but I invite everyone to come to us after the session. Uh, I had in the program a vote of thanks, very formal, but let me just say very briefly a big thank you to all my colleagues here on the podium, to the other organizations that have supported this event. Of course, it's uh, hosted by UNITA and UNDESA, 
but we have here Kat Tully from the School of International Futures, Duncan Kasbegs from the OECD, and uh, Riel Miller from uh, UNESCO, and my friend Pierre Skonerad from the Center for Public Service Innovation of the South African Government. So thanks a lot for all, to all of you for coming. Yeah. UNDP, that's me. And thank you all for coming, and please stay in touch. Please do give us some feedback and your details so we can, uh, not everybody gave us their cards and we didn't share them back. So this is a way of connecting us all. And thanks so much. Uh, I heard there is a web uh, transfer happening live. I hope that there is a recording available. We'll, we'll see whether we can get our hands on that and then share it also via, via this network. Thank you all.